刚刚有讲到一点点，所以就是啊、uh, ，one of them 的 focus 是帮台湾的品牌带到国外去。So we focus a lot on rapid research、um, and customer insights to develop brand strategy, communication strategy for、um, Taiwanese brands such as Cubo AI. We've also worked with DHL in Taiwan and this little unit called QB,、um, which is a bai fen tofu. I don't know if you know. Bai fen tofu. Yeah, that's what they're called. Bai fen tofu. It's really cute.、Um, so we help them using、um, to develop customer insights and develop a brand story, develop their digital strategy. To take them to the states, a lot of them don't even know kind of what they're trying to say, and we help them refine that story a little bit.、Um, so what's the rapid research? The rapid research is like the surveys that we're talking about right now. Yeah, yeah surveys, <laughs> customer interviews, stuff like that. We'll go through that in a little bit.、Um, but just a little background about me. I also covered this <laughs> earlier. This is、uh, originally in Taiwan. I lived in the U.S. for the last ten years.、Um, the reason why I'm kind of in this world is because I did a lot of product development. And、um, customer experience strategy for American Express, right? So、um, during the time I was there, I was there for about five years. I launched、um, in-app mobile messaging, virtual assistant chat,、um, our community forum, and also our Twitter surfacing. So I've been very engaged with the American consumer since I started working in the states. And my entire job was actually focusing on delivering products that customers want and garnering insights from these car members. Cool. All right. So. Thank you all for being here today. Top three questions we'll be answering today:、uh, How to know what customers want, where do we launch, and how to continue success.、Um, we'll go through those questions with a specific case study,、um, Cubo AI, which is my client、uh, from 2019. We launched Cubo AI Smart Baby Monitor in on Indiegogo in 2019.、Um, they were the top 10 smart baby monitors on、uh, Amazon. I think it was late la last year and early this year, and then also a CES Innovation Award on. Um, so a little bit about this little bird right here. This is the smart baby monitor that was developed in Taiwan,、um, and they launched in Taiwan in 2018, and I helped them take them to the states、uh, last year. So we'll go through how we went through how we answered these questions、um, for Cubo. Sounds good. Cool. All right. Oh, wrong side. <laughs> okay. So how do you know what customers want?、Um, just to kind of, I think everybody is quite well versed in things, and I'll just. Deep dive into one of the bullets on each of these topics,、um, so that we can talk in more depth.、Um, so, for instance, the one that we want to talk more into depth on for this one is conducting surveys.、Um, a lot of brands in Taiwan are afraid of doing, of trying to figure out how to get customer insights in the states,、um, or they don't know how. And one of the things that we did really well at Cubo was that we used Facebook ads as a base to garner a lot of responses. Right. So. At Cubo, we saw over six thousand surveys done for、um, MVP validation, and that's all through Facebook ads, right? That's through incentives, incentivizing the customer or the user、um, to take these surveys, and then we also conducted over fifteen users、um, af interviews after they tested the products.、Um, a lot of folks in Taiwan, I think, are afraid of the cost that comes with customer insights. But actually, fundamentally, doing these things helps us understand what are some key features to implement in the product before we take it to the states, as well as of what may be some key gaps that were there that needed needed to be fixed before we even launch the product in the states.、Um, so, for instance, security being a big deal in the states versus not so much being a big deal here for baby monitors,、uh, and we can go into those specific. In、uh, instances, a little bit more later, but we also did a three thousand surveys.、Um, Prior to the product launch, and this is this will lead into the crowdfunding aspect of the business,、um, but this also has to do with kind of understanding the marketing、um, <coughs> topics that we want to mention. What's the storyline? What makes sense for the American consumer? So I tried to find a screenshot of the survey, but the surveys are down now because the product <laughs> is live, so they're not there anymore. But I wanted to put out a quick demonstration of what something like a MVP survey could look like. So this is the hot sauce that I work on now, right? And、um, we deployed the same methodology in Taiwan, where we where we sent out over a hundred surveys、um, for people in Taiwan. We had a smaller amount because we're a small brand,、um, but ultimately we asked them. We did a pre-taste survey where we asked them about their meal preferences or how do they eat, similar to what you guys are doing now.、Um, And then also, like we tested out different flavor profiles descriptions to see what their appetite was for、um, for the flavor, to allow us to allow us for、um, when we pitch to them, like when we sell. Right. We should actually add. I was just thinking, add, <laughs> add their product into our lunch boxes. Yeah. 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 We help you promote. You help us with、uh, serving. <laughs> <laughs>
And I think that's like nowadays crowdfunding has it used to I think back in the day, which is like five years ago, back in the day it used to be more of a um, funding mechanism for like startups who are trying to to be able to actually manufacture their stuff. But now it's become such a strong marketing channel, right? Because yeah. it's a great way to showcase that customers want your product. Mm -hmm. um, you take on way less risk, to be honest, because you you basically don't have to make your product until you get you get funded. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately you have the marketing channel to be able to say, hey, this is always here. Like Cuba will always have this on their web, on on the internets, right? Yeah. And this 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 fact the fact that they fulfill their goal so is always something they can mention. But then right. you were saying that it takes a lot. Of Seems like it's a, it was a relatively big setup for able to launch this. I think if you know what you're doing, you don't have to have a lot of people, right? If you know, you have a good ads person, if you have um, somebody who's good at content, right? Um, that's pretty much really what you need. And oh, sorry, good designer, of course. But yeah. Do those, do those platforms enable all of the all of the uh, all of the methods to constantly? They, they do have it, so they do have it on integrated within the platform, but I have to say, if you're trying to build a brand, especially from a baby monitor standpoint, right, parents want to feel safe, mm -hmm. and they, they, they need extra, you know, extra trust building this, um, you want to engage with them outside of just the platform, because the updates that you get here, they're very, like, Indiegogo based, so they're not gonna be as, um, I don't know, as branded as you would want it to be, right? So you can email them and you can have the updates, but it's definitely not, I think, as strong of a connection as if you emailed them on a separate account. Does so that make sense? you collect their email via Indiegogo, yeah, and then email them on your own. Yeah, you can you can email them here. We email them here, and we also email them separately. It's like a newsletter, right? So then yeah. Indiegogo. Yeah, there's a newsletter within Indiegogo that Indiegogo sends out to their community. And then there's like an update email that you send out to your backers. Um, but then at the same time, you can also send out branded emails on your own yeah. as a way to build connection with the consumer. Yeah. You know, there's research saying that like, this is probably not a cheap product, right? But let's say for engine oil, mm -hmm. if it's $30 US, mm -hmm. is, that, is that price range? I think it depends on your story because there's like shoes that were like 50 bucks or like 80 bucks, right? I think 30 might be a little bit low. Yeah, yeah it sounds like this is more of a higher ticket item. Yeah, but I, I don't, so there, the, the reason why I hesitate is because crowdfunding has changed its shape a lot nowadays, especially the, the main thing is like the innovative piece to it. Mm -hmm. So if you have the innovative piece to it and then you can either bundle your item with something or you can tell uh, kind of a more sophisticated story around it, then I don't see why not. It's, it's, it's my, you just have to make sure you hit the right target. Yeah, because I, I have a friend who, he makes board games, just himself. Yeah. Um, and okay. he raised like 200K on USD mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. Kickstarter on his own. Yeah, our yeah. friend Mark Chung with a snake yeah. mask, I think it was 600K yeah. US yeah. dollars and on Kickstarter and in Indigo that yeah. he raised. And it's like a low yeah. unit. Yeah. 30 bucks. Oh, $20. So about the same. Yeah. 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 Um, it's possible. What did you spend um, the two months, like the build up phase before the launch of Indiegogo? What, what, where did you spend your most time? You said you were preparing mm. uh, a lead list, like an audience. Uh, yeah, the audience, the lead list, like our. Um, how, how did you do that? Like a giveaway? Or yeah, we did giveaways of the surveys that I mentioned. So, so the 3,000 surveys. That right. was really important. So yes. we did we did a survey on Facebook. We used the Facebook ads to do surveys that were testing out the MVP, yes. not the MVP, but like the sorry, the UVP. We were testing out the storyline, and then through that, we told them what product we what we were at the end, and asked them if they wanted to purchase or not. And, and then you send were, them the link. And we sent them the link. Yeah, and then we collected the leads from there. So that was lead collection. Um, there was also like if you fill out the survey, you have to like you be entered for a giveaway for a diaper. 
like uh, sorry, mm-hmm. six months of diapers because yeah, well, <laughs> for any parent, I think on. like six months of diapers is a lot, yeah. right? Yeah. So for I think for, if you were to do surveys, mm-hmm. to do them effectively, you really need incentive. Would you say that 100%. the survey is the first stage of MVP testing, and then this is like the second stage, like the ultimate stage, or is mm-hmm. it already from the surveys you could tell? this is a product market fit? No, I mean, for, for for this product, we did the survey, and then we they built the MVP, and then they sent it out mm-hmm. to be ah, tested. Okay. And then as they got it tested, they basically did, like, mm-hmm. their post-product testing survey. Yeah, because I think ultimately, they had to validate the idea in a new market, which is why the 6,000 right. surveys were necessary to yeah. validate the idea. Wow. And then, it was the mil- manufacturer and the product and making sure that the product was right. So mm-hmm. this testing, actually, if someone spent some bucks or mm-hmm. you just got the feedback uh, from them, like, did, did anyone purchase it? Like, uh, no, they didn't purchase it. Mm-hmm. We, we sent it to them and they like uh, we, we did interviews in the beginning of their use, did check-ins throughout, because it's a, it's a long-term product, right? Uh-huh. So we basically interviewed, um, we spent about two weeks with these guys, two to three, two to three weeks with these guys to get their feedback, um, built a relationship with these customers, uh, and then by the end of the three weeks, we tell them how much it costs. They don't know how much it costs in the okay. beginning, oh, we tell them how much it costs at the end to see if they would buy. Okay. Yeah, it's an interesting methodology. Um, yeah, you don't tell them how much it costs? No, until the end. And then they put in money? No, 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 they don't, they don't no, 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 not, not this part. It's oh, okay, the survey. Yeah, the survey part. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. the beginning. This is like, by the point we get to here, the market's already been validated. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That we're, we're already okay. set on that. Mm-hmm. Did you feel like how close slash accurate were your survey results compared to actual people who bought it? Uh, almost 100%. Yeah. yeah, it was very close. Because oh. the ultimate thing is, the one thing the team did really, really well is that like, beyond the survey results, they, they the continuous communication made sure that people said that they would buy actually did come back. Oh, I see. If you if we didn't do that continuous communication to find those brand content, like tell these stories, reinforce trust, all of these things, then the survey results might not have been as accurate. Mm-hmm. Because you're not caught because there's it, the American market is so competitive. Mm-hmm. Right? So somebody could decide, oh this is really interesting, I'm definitely down to buy it, but I haven't heard from you in months. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm gonna go buy Nana instead. Right. How long was the from the survey to crowdfund time time frame? About a month and a half. Oh wow, super fast. Yeah. So fast. Uh, sorry, probably two months actually. Probably two months. Yeah. That's, yeah. It. That's fast. How do you guys decide on a one point four six nine million target? <laughs> oh three three. That's a really good question. I actually can't remember. <laughs> I actually can't remember. Multiply that by thirty. Yeah, you have to multiply that's that by thirty. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Did you intentionally know. set that low so you can surpass it by a thousand percent? Uh, I'm not able to <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay. There's an answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the 800 backers. They're really kind of the first adapters. They, they, yep. That's one of the reasons why they're willing to quote unquote buy um, first rate. Uh, and then if you guys can't deliver it, they get the money back. Yes. Yes, 100%. And actually, this is the one thing that uh, I learned a lot from this launch was because it's a baby product, the amount of trust that needs to go into developing a baby product and marketing it is so much Mm -hmm. that launching on Indiegogo probably wasn't the best idea. Like, it it worked out for us at the end, but it took us a lot of trust building to get them to that point where they were willing to purchase. Versus if I was like, for example, um, a QB, like my other client, that's probably an easier product to say, like, hey, you guys want to check this out, it's really cool, right? Um, but people don't feel like there's a risk involved because it's not their baby. So that's something that, like, when you're, if you're thinking about a crowdfunding product, think about where, who your audience is and whether or not they would find crowdfunding to be an interesting or a ideal place for them to test out innovation. First 48 hours that we cut that customer trust. Okay, cover that. Awesome. So continuing success. Um, the one element I'm gonna focus on here is actually building a content library for your continuing success. 
So after you launch, you're going to want to continuously communicate with your customers, right? Especially if you're crowdfunding too. If you're in the middle of manufacturing a product, you want to keep your customers happy. You don't want them to go around saying that you're late or anything like that um, and creating doubt in their mind. So one of the ways that we um, built a content library is to utilize influencers to build um, just content in general. Even though it's like a, a little bit of awareness, a little bit of impressions, ultimately the images that we're getting and the quotes that we're getting is enough for us to be able to reuse again in our different ads and different communications, stuff like that. Uh, what method, can you go back to that? Yeah, sure, what method, because also we've had a lot of experience doing this kind of yeah. stuff, yeah. what um, methods or platforms did you guys use to do this? For and how did you diversify? Yeah. Yeah, um, it's really difficult to find good influencers. Um, there's a couple ways. We started off just as a small brand, mm -hmm. just reaching out to influencers ourselves and yeah. just finding out. Like, I think we reached out to over like 50 influencers. What, like micro influencers or like um, more? medium to my, like 5,000 to 10,000. Okay, yeah. pretty micro. Yeah. yeah, pretty micro. Yeah, I mean, 10,000 is a swipe up, right? Uh, but for us, we wanted to save costs. <clears throat> so we wanted to exchange the product. The product, I mean, the product by itself is pretty expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So we could exchange product. Uh, but like for instance, um, for some of my other clients, we still, we paid them like 100 or $200 for instance, and those are very micro influencers mm -hmm. to get their quotes and to get their images for reuse later on. Mm -hmm. uh, because ultimately we know that like, I will be paying double, triple that for the same amount of brand images that I'll get yeah. that are static. Yeah. This, we, because we are just now entering this phase with our skincare mm -hmm. brand, um, it's for sure like we've had the biggest push in the last couple of weeks by doing um, influencer marketing. Yeah. Um, it works really well. Yeah. Um, but there are lots of shitty influencers. Um, and I think the micro influencers is, is really a great way to go because they really care about building their audience. They care about engaging with their audience. They're not as expensive. They're willing to work for the products themselves instead of getting uh, some huge cash sum doesn't make sense for a lot of brands to actually go with those like mid and high, uh, those like celebrity level. Yeah. Um, because you know, like Jolene for sure is not answering any of your questions. Yeah. Like it's like a team of people who maybe will do. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like a lot of those influencers, like you can, <coughs> you can, they have like really, really good precision targeting. Like you can find like moms yes. that have an audience of moms. Yeah, yeah. And like yeah. you can like precisionly like mm -hmm. target um, a group like audience or like a, like a group yeah. where you cannot really do with like a, the higher the, the, the higher up you go. Mm -hmm. I found that um, there's so there's a lot of different ways to work with them. Yeah. Um, there's platforms available to work mm -hmm. with them with really inflated numbers. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of like cannibalism in in the market that you're in, in. Like there's you know people follow the same people, yeah. and so like the the follower count is actually really <coughs> confusing, uh, and your reach yeah. and these kinds of things that people will ask you to pay for is actually really messed up. Yeah. Um, so I think <coughs> this like influencer marketing is like of course like the thing that all brand marketers need to like be utilizing now, but really engaging and using them properly is very, very challenging thing yeah. I found. Yeah. Um, work for you? Uh, we, so now we tried, we dabbled in it like really, really early um, this year, but we didn't have our home base set up. I and that's, that's something I think also people don't. What do you mean by home Like base? we don't, we didn't have our website properly plugged in and, oh, and okay. set up where like all the traffic's gonna come, mm -hmm. and then what? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we gotta be, we have to have things set up where we know what is going on. Like, yeah. okay, we, you're gonna help us promote, how do we know what traffic's coming from you? What sort of specific UTM or like oh, okay. code tracking is coming? So we can know like every dollar we spend, we're getting like who's performing the best out of all the people mm -hmm. we're using. So we yeah. were not set up well. Two, two weeks ago, we launched a group buying campaign. Oh, I love you, that. Very good. Yeah. It works really well. Yeah. 
What, what's it designed to? It's kind of like, it's it's basically um, like an on influencer. Go, on go. Yeah, go. On go. It's it's basically um, we we utilized an influencer who had like about a quarter of a million followers. Mm -hmm. She um, we we sent her our products a month ahead of time. She had a chance to use them and kind of form her opinion. We gave her some sort of general brand guidelines, some some things we'd like to point out about the product, but we don't tell her anything to say specifically yeah. about the products because we want her to talk naturally, mm -hmm. talk in a way that she has curated her own her her own mm -hmm. channel. You yeah. know, like we don't want to force her to be anyone she she isn't. Yeah. And basically she could offer uh, a discount approved by us to her audience. Like mm -hmm. and we got a bunch of orders through this method. Mm -hmm. And it works pretty well. We're gonna we're continuing on with a few more campaigns mm -hmm. at the end of the year. Um, but I think finding the like finding the right influencers is a real big challenge. Yeah. But it is like a, a must for like um, product or service brands. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we did a lot of these with my with the agency side of our business mm -hmm. with, with in China and other markets. Mm -hmm. And the same issue with expensive products. Yeah. So we had to figure out a way to get around this. One was with like Marshall's headphones. And oh, yeah. These kinds of things are like three hundred dollar products. You can't really send them out to like uh, all of these influencers. It's different with shampoo. We did one with two thousand influencers in China. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can send sh shampoo. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's you sent shampoo to two thousand. We did two thousand shampoo bottles. Mm. It's good also for the brand because these products expire. Oh. And, um, you That's cannot true. sell products into retail with like a with with like less yeah. than five months of expiration date. It's illegal. So they can use all their old stock that they can't legally sell and just like boom offload oh, it wow. like That's fast. Nice. And they're like, cool. Uh, we can this we can this is a good way for us to like get That's rid of all this awesome. stuff. Otherwise, they have to dump it right mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. like legally. Um, but another way was to like set up experience centers mm -hmm. where. You like set up, you find a place, an office, you set up an experience center, you get all the brand side people in there to answer questions and help, mm -hmm. and you set up some corners in there and all the influencers come. And they yeah. take the products off to the corner with their own little yeah. stuff, yeah. you oh, know. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. film it, they talk about it, if they have any questions yeah. that people can answer. Mm -hmm. Or they or we ran these like send and re send and receive logistic nightmare the bullshit really. Yeah. It's just like send the product, it was received, uh, send it back within this time frame, I got a packaging sent, mm -hmm. send it again. But those kind of products are really difficult yeah. to do. But I, I totally agree, this kind of like UGC stuff is like absolutely the most critical thing yeah. you can really get. Yeah. It's not only about, there's two sides of the story. What you're talking about here is like the content, which yeah. is essential. Yeah. But also, yeah, you do get lots of awareness and recognition and conversion. Yeah. I mean, I think the interesting thing is actually the um, Taiwan market is a less mature influencer market right now. Yeah. It's starting to become more mature. Mm -hmm. So actually it makes a lot of sense for the conversion to be very high here. Um, but actually in the States, um, and this is something I tell my clients too, because the expectation is that the conversion will be very high in the States. Mm -hmm. They're not. Because the influencer fatigue yeah, has set totally, in the totally. States. Yeah. So then for us, it's a, you're right. Like, Building the use of content, but also the awareness element of it, being where your customers are and what they're looking at is something that we, from a brand in Taiwan, there's not much you can do other than to do that, right? You just want to make sure you're digitally, you're always in their face, right? That you're always, well, that sounds aggressive, but you're always kind of where they are, who they're looking at. Um, so it's actually pretty critical um, to, to get started with that. Um, and you can do it at a very low cost. To at least get started, and then build up your build up your um, your library from there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. With inexpensive products, for sure, you can you can often use it just to, to, to as just a giveaway. Yeah, yeah. But I see the challenge with this. Yeah, is, yeah. yeah. I mean, this one I think from a it was either for a, because baby monitors are something that people really need. Um, for us, we would rather have than because we thought about the the send and receive situation. Um, but then if your baby or is already using it, then it would be tough to be like, okay, now take it off and then give it back to us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like for um, for Cubo though, it was really important in the beginning. So we did um, bite the bullet on that and we just kind of stuck with 
for them. And um, the good thing about that was that they continuously post about it throughout their baby journey, um, which, is, which is something that the product team was smart enough to design, that the baby yeah. product is huge, um, and that it will continuously show up in different um, channels. Um, but to go back into kind of building, how, having your brand story, like main talking points ready for content building in general, this is just a really quick slide I did um, for another presentation, but I took a screenshot here. Basically, um, what we did was we leveraged, we built out specific talking points that we knew worked out for Cubo, and we put them into a chatbot. Um, now, I, I, we can talk into like why chatbot later on, but the main point being that like we always knew that we would talk about the reviews. We always knew that we would talk about these top five features, right? So we had everything that was ready for our talking points in this one channel that, or for example, in one folder, so that any time we need to create a new campaign, we start that all over again, right? Because I think whenever it comes to promotions or when it comes to marketing, you guys are very aware, you can never say things too many times. <laughs> in different ways. Um, so we basically, from the Indiegogo campaign to building the website, to um, launching different kind of seasonal promotions, or launching in different markets, we use the same content over and over and over again to allow for our team for faster deployment and also just constantly telling the same thing but in different flavors mm -hmm. um, for the consumer. And that's, that's really at the core of kind of the first thing you want to do by the after you start building up your um, your launch. I have a random question for both of you guys. Um, when you guys reach out to influencers via like Instagram or something, uh, what kind of language did you guys use to reach out to them and what has been effective? Because I, I guess I've said stuff for a little bit before mm. and uh, I guess I feel like there are effective ways of getting them to respond to you and then not so effective mm. ways. Mm. I mean, it depends on the influencer. Like it depends on your product, depends on you're like for for example, like do you go like hi, I'm Jane from Cubo, like mm. oh one hundred percent. I'm like you know how do you guys? I'm like their best friend. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you just you try to be as like as personable as you can be over email for the product like this, but for my other products not so much, mm. right? Because like, tech products they don't need you to be their best friend. They need you. They need to know fast what these features are and why this is cool, mm. right? So it depends on the. Um, my wife deals a lot with that because in Taiwan, but in our discussions yeah. with, about this is, um, I want, I've asked her to like start quite early and not from, but basically like we shouldn't, it's a business transaction at the end of the day, at the end of the day but we also want to build relationships with people mm -hmm. who ideally are, have some sort of extended reach and match our target audience. So it makes sense for us as a brand to follow them and to be active with them. So I've asked her to spend time building relationships with people who make sense, you know, and then maybe they'll get to know us over time. They'll be more receptive to us, to, to, to working with us. You know, we have a couple of people like that um, and it's been much easier to approach them afterwards. Um, we've even, through this method, we've, we've seen influencers reach out to us and say, Hey, uh, hey, Ari, you know, I'd like to work with you. Mm -hmm. Can you send me some product? Yeah, and then it, it, this is. So as in, like, you follow them, you comment on their. Yes, we like be, that we need to also engage. be active with with those people. You know, mm -hmm. that that that, makes that, sense. that um, align with us. Yeah. Um, I think that there are a lot of like middle agents that can help in the negotiation and mm -hmm. in the contacting of these companies. In fact, one of our clients, a company called Viral Access, uh, does this. Like that's mm -hmm. they have like a huge database of influencers, and yeah. that is kind of like what they do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, um, like internally, because we we've been talking a lot about this recently. Like we've got a couple methods right now. One is going through like the Plan Go group buying, who have relationships with their influencers. Yeah. So we are going through them like we did two weeks ago. And the other is developing now our own process of reaching out. It's a very set, structured process using Notion <laughs> to go through and uh, going, going through the, the checklist of things we need to do to really streamline the process. And one of them is like uh, introducing ourselves, 
letting them know a little bit more about our brand and what we'd like to achieve. Let them know that we've been following them, that we like what they've been, like what we've, we've noticed a couple things they've been doing. People, people are narcissistic at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> like, and mm. a little bit of like flattery is not gonna <laughs> hurt, you know? Yeah. Like, just be like, wow, it's all these cool beach pictures you've taken recently. Like everyone's like, oh, with their freaking oh, chins in the water. It's like, what the hell? Yeah. Another trend in Taiwan, okay. <laughs> you know, like everyone's at the beach with these like two foot, flip, these like three foot fins or whatever. You know, you gotta oh. see this stuff happen. But you guys not, seen all this not stuff Instagram right? enough. <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, it's all, I mean, this is like the thing. We were out snorkeling and like, I'm seeing, yeah. literally, I'm at the beach snorkeling, looking at fish and swimming around like cameras and people in the water. Yes. Like, doing, it's like, God, this is like <laughs> insane. I mean, it is insane it. right That's now. Um, but I think, yeah, some, like reaching out to them, building a relationship with them mm -hmm. ahead of time. Thinking of it a little bit ahead. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. That's it. Sweet. Yeah. Cool. All right. That that was pretty much the end of my presentation, though. Oh. Nice. Yeah. We, we answered the three questions in in various ways. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah. love the discussion. Do you guys have any other questions for me? Who was involved in doing all of this work? Can you describe the team and where they were? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Worked? Sure. Uh, so I was hired on as a consultant for the business um, for Cubo. Um, when I first joined um, the project, there were, well, there was a CMO, and then there was me on the U.S. side, um, and then there was an ads person, U.S. ads person, and then um, I hired on a community manager for them um, for social media, and that was the content building side of things, um, and that was it. So th this is a Taiwanese company? This is a Taiwanese company. They launched in 2018 in Taiwan. Um, they were a group of executives formerly at Virgo. And oh, sorry. Verbo, the dog company. The dog dog company. Oh, yeah. Dog company. Yeah. And then um, they decided to come out and launch their own um, oh, wow. Cubo. Yeah. Let me just go back to their. Are they still related to them, or is it like? Uh, not necessarily. It was just they were at the same business. They were in the same oh. business together. Yeah, and they obviously have expertise in cameras. Why so is it called Cubo? Yeah. Just curious. Yeah. So Cubo was um, the. It's a cub, like a mama cub. And then oh. the robot, right? Oh. So it's a smart baby monitor. Okay. So it's called a Cubo. So it's not Cubo. It's not Cubo. <laughs> Cubo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So cute. Um, yeah, what's actually yeah, what's yeah. even more funny, I feel like, is at the time it's called Cubo AI. Mm -hmm. We thought it was super obvious that AI has to be capitalized, but yeah. many people were like, "Oh, this Cubo Al." Yeah, that's what it was. Al. Cubo, Cubo what? Al. A L. A L. Really and I was wild. like, "Oh." Yeah, yeah. because I think it, it looks weird to me to be lowercase. Exactly. Yeah, so like now, the left, right? Yeah. It's lowercase. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, now Cubo AI with a lowercase i, because too many people who are not in tech, which <laughs> would be like, this is Cubo <laughs> Al. I think sometimes yeah. people think. So, I mean, you can solve this with a survey, I guess, but sometimes people can overthink too much, like, and they they actually like end up sabotaging them themselves mm. from. Some previous experience, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Like for me, I would. I don't know. I never even saw it spelled with the lowercase i. I think a lot of element that we learned throughout this process was um, because of the UVP of Kubo, um, it it comes at the core of protecting, um, you know, promoting safety for your baby. Mm -hmm. um, not every parent were very like in tune with the technology that was that was doing this for them, except for the fact that they wanted it, right? Yeah. So they, they knew they wanted it, um, but like they knew it was using AI to do it, but not necessarily like understanding the mechanics behind it, which is fair. Um, but like that was a really interesting exposure into the into the US market, because I think when we're looking at like New York, California, most folks will be quite aware of what that means. Um, but we were, we were getting a lot of folks from Florida, from Texas, you know, that weren't necessarily as um, well versed in this industry. Um, so I think there, it was interesting doing the customer interviews, I gotta say, because it was just people of different kind of backgrounds of different mm -hmm. markets um, reacting to this start being bonded, but all at the very core, very similar um, desire is just to protect your baby. Just 
different flavors of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. All right. Thank you guys so much. Good job.